Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has recently talked about how during the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, there was a moment where she actually thought she was legitimately going to die. Uh, she hasn't really talked much about that incident until now during an Instagram live stream where she uh, discloses some more details and she shares how it really was the situation where she felt like that was the end of her life. Um, so we're going to show some clips from her Instagram uh, live stream and then we're going to talk about the response because the response to her sharing this traumatic experience, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's absolutely morally reprehensible and you really just you're learning how cold people are in politics where they've dehumanized folks like AOC to the point where you know they, they are laughing at her having what she believed was a near-death experience and it's just gross but um nonetheless let's listen to her story because I think this is important I open the door when all of a sudden I hear that whoever was trying to get inside got into my office um, and then I realize that it's too late, that it's too late for me to get into the closet. And so I, I go back in and I, I hide back in, um, in the bathroom behind the door. And then I just start to hear these yells of, where is she? Where is she? And I just thought to myself, they got inside. And so I hide behind my door like this, like I'm here and the bathroom door starts going like this, like the bathroom door is behind me or rather in front of me. And I'm like this and the door hinges right here. And I just hear, where is she? Where is she? And um, this was the moment where I thought everything was over. Um, and the weird thing about moments like these is that you lose all sense of time. Um, in retrospect, um, maybe it was four seconds. Maybe it was five seconds, maybe it was 10 seconds, maybe it was one second, I don't know. It felt like my brain was able to have so many thoughts in that moment um, between these screams and these yells of where is she, where is she? And so I go down and I just, I mean, I thought I was going to die. Um, and I had a lot of thoughts. You have a lot of thoughts, <laughs> I think, when you're in a situation like that. Um, and like also one of those thoughts that I had was, you know, I just happened to, you know, be a spiritual person and be raised in that context. And I really just felt like, you know, if this is the plan for me, um, then people will be able to take it from here. Um, I had a lot of thoughts, but that was the thought that I had about you all. Um, I felt that um, if this was the journey that my life was taking, that I felt that things were going to be okay. Um, um, and that, you know, I had fulfilled my purpose. That is horrifying. It sounds like a nightmare. Now, she later learned that the individual who was screaming, where is she, was a Capitol Police officer. And once he came in, they still kind of got weird vibes. Because if you're a Capitol Police officer, shouldn't you announce that you are Capitol Police? And uh, after he 
was talking with her, he was still super aggressive, and he told her, he basically yelled at her, go to this area in the Capitol. Uh, he didn't tell her which room they should be in in this particular building, and when they got there, they ran there, they weren't escorted there, her and one of her staffers ran there, and they were basically left wondering, where do we go? They heard the rioters outside, so they were questioning whether or not they were in more danger after listening to this individual, and even though in theory, like, you'd think, okay, this is someone who's supposed to protect me, it's a Capitol Police officer, right? Well, after seeing the way that they opened the gates for the insurrectionists, I'm not so sure that that individual was on her side. Like, if I were in that situation and Capitol Police basically let this happen, at least a substantial portion of them were and they were taking selfies, I wouldn't necessarily feel safe. So the fact that they got a bad vibe from this individual after, you know, he was screaming at her, I, I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. Now, she explains that this situation was particularly traumatic because she experienced past trauma before and she came out as a sexual assault survivor, which is something that is very, very difficult to do. Folks who tell us to move on, that it's not a big deal, that we should forget what's happened, or even telling us to apologize, um, these are the same tactics of abusers. And um, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and I haven't told many people that in my life. Um, but when we go through trauma, trauma compounds on each other. I give her credit. That is something that's really difficult to do because in this day and age, when we're supposed to be applauding sexual assault survivors and encouraging them to come out and share their stories, like this is the Me Too era, right? You have so many people like laughing this off downplaying it oh she's just being melodramatic nobody wanted to kill her is that so because one of the individuals who was charged during the capital insurrection openly talked about wanting to assassinate aoc specifically is it really that shocking to think that white supremacists who are violent who are storming the capital wouldn't be targeting individuals like aoc ilhan omar rashida talib I just, you know, the callousness is really what strikes me from this story. Like, the response to her is what strikes me. And I don't want to give you this false impression that most people dismissed this and, and mocked her. Um, because most people were supportive. Most people, you know, are standing in solidarity with AOC as she shares this story. But usually, you know, the most negative uh, things that we see are what kind of stay with us. Now, one more clip that I want to play for you before I talk about the response from right-wingers and some who claim to be on the left um, is from Representative Katie Porter. In an interview with Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC, she talked about how uh, when her and AOC connected, the response uh, that AOC had, like the look on her face, um, she was rattled. Well, at first she, you know, she saw me um, she and we waved. I went into my office and a couple seconds later, she knocked and she said, you know, could we, could we come in? And I said, of course. Um, and she began to, uh, you know, her staffer was trying to describe what had happened. And Alex is, is really usually like unfailingly polite um, and very personable. And she wasn't even really talking to me. She was opening up doors. And, and I was like, can I help you? Like, what are you looking for? And she said, I'm looking for where I'm going to hide. And the thing that will always stay with me the two memories that really, you know, especially as a mom, I think were just really powerful for me was when she said, you know, I, I was saying, well, don't worry, I'm a mom, I'm calm, I've got everything here we need, we could live for like a month in this office. And she said, I just hope I get to be a mom, I hope I don't die today. And the, the second thing is she was wearing um, heels. And I remember her saying to me, I, I was wearing flats. And I remember her saying to me, I knew I shouldn't have worn heels. How am I going to run? And we went and we found her a pair of sneakers to wear from one of my staffers so that she could run if she needed to literally run for her life. I can't imagine what she was going through. That sounds absolutely horrible. And this is going to be something that stays with her for the rest of her life. Like she was already dealing with existing trauma, being a sexual assault survivor. But that moment, that's going to stay with her forever. Uh, she's going to carry that with her for the rest of her life. Um, speaking from firsthand experience, when you deal with 
psychological trauma, it doesn't just like go away. Like you can't just get over it. As easy as that sounds, you can't. It stays with you for years and decades. Um, uh, but the response was just, as I alluded to earlier, I don't even know how to describe this. It's just, it's cold hearted. So uh, right wing conspiracy theorist Steven Crowder tweeted out an image of Karl Marx with the shirt that says seize the means of reproduction. And he wrote, allegedly AOC's abuser was found. Um, I'm not necessarily sure what the joke is here. Apparently this is supposed to be funny, uh, but this is just his way of belittling her experience there. Uh, Michael Tracy tweeted out, Good to know that any loopy delusion expounded by a politician must now be respected and, quote, believed under the aegis of trauma. Unreal. And it's not just right-wingers. There were some individuals who claim to be left-wingers, which I don't think that they're left-wingers if they're downplaying this. Uh, that's, that, you know, they're just laughing at this. Oh, well, you know, she's being melodramatic. Um, you know, what about the folks who are uh, dying because they don't have health care? Since she didn't agree to the strategy of force the vote, therefore that means she doesn't support Medicare for all in my twisted view of the world. And therefore, you know, I don't care if she thought she was going to die because what about the people who are dying now? Like the, the mental gymnastics that people jump through in their minds to downplay this, it just shows you that like, there's, there's no rationale, there's no logic, there's no human empathy. It's just like in politics, we've come to a point where we always work backwards from whatever conclusion we've arrived at. And some folks have just chosen to make AOC the enemy. Demonize like one of the only left-wing members of Congress who's a genuine ally. Demonize her, and so whatever she says is invalid, anything she says is wrong, because she's the enemy. She's the enemy. This is the result of uh, conditioning by folks with very large platforms who just do nothing but rail against AOC. Attack, attack, attack. She's the enemy. She's stopping you from having Medicare for all. She's the problem. It's not corporate Democrats. It's not Republicans. It's her. It's just sickening. Like the state of the left right now, it it really worries me. Um, it, It's just, it's like a snake eating its own tail, right? demonizing AOC like it, I think that holding politicians accountable is absolutely necessary and warranted you have to hold everyone in Congress accountable because they're in a position of power they're in a position of great influence where they can actually affect change but perhaps maybe when they're like sharing their story about how they believe they were going to die that's not necessarily the right time to do it maybe maybe this is just me uh, wait until a different instance maybe when it's more appropriate to bring up something like maybe when they're sharing the fact that they're a sexual assault survivor and dealt with existing trauma, that might not necessarily be the best time to air your grievances with this individual who is an ally to us, believe it or not. It's just shocking to me. And because she wasn't actually being hunted down by, you know, a far right extremist storming the Capitol because it was a Capitol police officer, people are claiming that um, she's just being melodramatic. Does that make her feelings any less real? There are people who literally suffer from panic disorder, who have what's known as amygdala hijack, I think it's called, where they just like inexplicably have panic attacks. They uh, have this like influx of adrenaline, their heart starts racing, they start sweating, and they have that fight or flight response. It could be like, just the most random time ever. You could be in the store grocery shopping, and all of a sudden, you get the instinct to get out, run, because you feel like you're going to die. There's no reason for it. But people get this. Does it mean they're actually in danger? No. But are those feelings real? Yeah. They're pretty fucking real. They're pretty fucking terrifying. I'm speaking from firsthand experience, where you could just be doing the most random thing ever. Watching a movie, you're relaxing, you're having a great time, and all of a sudden... There it goes. You're in full-on panic mode out of nowhere. And you feel like you're going to die. You have that instinct to run away. But there's nothing that's attacking you. So you, you kind of just like sit there and you try to play it off. Because you don't want to look like an idiot in front of other people. Um, but in, in your own mind, in your body, you're feeling all of this. It's not just psychological. It's physiological as well. Your heart's racing. And it's horrifying. Is there actually danger? No, but that doesn't make the feeling any less real and horrifying. And each time you suffer from a panic attack like this, you know, um, you remember it. 
you fear when the next one is going to come. This is what AOC is trying to talk about. Because she had existing trauma, like, she's always in that mindset. You know, like, where if something traumatizing or scary happens, she immediately is going to think, oh my god, it's happening again, I'm in great danger. And it's not like she didn't have a good reason to believe that she was in danger during this insurrection. Because again, there are violent white supremacists who want her dead. And I just, I don't understand the callousness. I don't get it. I just, um, yeah, I'm very, very uh, discouraged at the state of politics currently uh, on the left. But thankfully, you know, we're kind of in this echo chamber where the dumbest folks usually are the loudest, but they're not the majority. And we still can move forward and progress um, with the help of allies like AOC. And so if we expect her to, you know, represent us and have our backs, you know, maybe at a time like this, we should be having her back and uh, defending her because what she went through is awful.